I rise this afternoon to join the discussions on this motion on the riot at the Lusitan prison, which was on the 19th of September 2020. And I would also like to join with the other colleagues in expressing our, our condolences to the families of Winston Hubbard and Earl Graham, who lost their lives during the riot. I also want to commend the officers of the Guyana Prison Services for their professionalism. And I do hope that the, that the service, the, the Guyana Prison Service, would have provided professional counseling uh, for those who were involved in this traumatic event. Mr. Speaker, as was said by the move of the motion, Myself and Minister Ben visited the prison on the 19th uh, of September. And the reason why I, I accompanied Minister Ben was that early in the morning of the 19th, the prisoners did not take their breakfast when it was given to them. And there was a demand that they wanted to see the minister. And he asked me to accompany him because we knew that there were a few cases of COVID-19 that was in the prison. And Minister Ben was very worried because of the overcrowding situation at the prison that it can lead to a lot of people getting infected. So we went there around maybe about 12, sometime between 12 and 1 o'clock. And when we entered the prison, when we came through the doors of the, of the compound, there was a loud cheering of all the prisoners who were in the different polling bays because they saw Minister Ben and that he was going to address some of the issues that, was, uh, that they were feeling or they wanted to them to. And so, each of the holding bay, they identified a couple of representatives to talk about what were the issues that were affecting them. So holding bay one, holding bay two, holding bay three, and holding bay four. So we started from one end and we spoke with the representatives. I think there were about four or five of them. And the others were around them listening for what was being asked, and they would tell them what they wanted to be asked, and we continue by responding to some of the queries. So we were able to do one and two, and, um, and as we were going, I thought that the, the main question would have been questions relating to health and COVID. But actually, that was not what they were interested in. What they were interested in and what they told us was that because of COVID, since March or April or sometime there, that the court system had stopped, uh, had stopped to function. And therefore, many of them who were in there for remand and they wanted to get their trials and so forth, were not able to get their trials. And they have been there for this period of time without any trial. So their main focus was always about trying to see how you can restart the court system so that they can get a hearing. And almost all the complaints, you know, were around that. Of course, we knew that there were a few cases of COVID and we wanted to take measures uh, to make sure that those persons were identified and isolated so that they wouldn't spread it among the other prisoners. And unfortunately, after we engaged the, the guys in uh, holding day two, some of the others, perhaps, I don't know what uh, overcame them. And they start throwing some, some rocks at us. Uh, they, I think they broke the floor and they start uh, pelting the rocks. 
and then we took shelter under, uh, I think there was a tent in the yard, and then subsequently we left. And that, that was the kind of behavior. But we went there with all good intentions of helping to resolve and solve whatever problems had existed. And that's why we visited the prison. At least that's why I was there. I heard from the move of the motion that perhaps, and she praised it um, in such a way that maybe our visit was politically ill-advised. And, and maybe that had directly, um, it was directly that this was the possible cause for the chaos that ensued and the subsequent loss of life. Those were her words. We didn't go there for anybody to lose their life. We went there to protect people. We went there to offer support. We went there to be able to prevent transmission of COVID in Lusikan prison. That's why, why we went there. And without, no, well, without you know, going through what might be factual, we arrived at this type of argument, which is totally unfair. So perhaps if we want to lower the temperature, we have to start thinking about what we are saying to each other. And if we, if we are more careful with our words, we can prevent some of these very things that we all argue about and talk about. We can prevent these things from happening. With the COVID situation in, in the prison, after the, the riots and all of that, we ended up, by the end of September, having close to 200 and something cases of COVID in that prison. And to isolate those persons who became infected, we had to move them out of Luziknan. We subsequently took them to Madawini. We had to set up a different arrangement there so that we can isolate them. And after spending about 10 days there and they were all asymptomatic and so forth, we then brought them back into the, the prison situation. And so we took some measures to prevent further spread of the disease in the prison. And in addition to all of that, at Luziknan, with the help of one of the UN agencies, we were able then to set up some special isolation centers within the compound of Luziknan. So whenever anybody is tested positive, the prison authorities and the doctors who are working there would be able now to isolate them. And with COVID, because of overcrowding, there, there's always going to be a challenge that we'll face in these types of institutions where you can have rapid spread. And we have seen that. We have been able to contain the, the disease at Music Man. Uh, we have now, I think, about 16 cases who have been isolated. But we've seen now, as I speak today, we have about 33 cases at Tumeri. And already we have taken measures in place to be able to isolate all those persons and have them separate from the general population. We also saw, as of today, we have four prison officers in New Amsterdam who have tested positive. And one prisoner at New Amsterdam have tested positive and we have isolated them. So we are there to offer service. And in fact, during September last year, we have added more nurses and doctors to the prison service so that they can help uh, in, in terms of protecting people's lives by offering this type of service. They have put special measures in place when, when you have an intake of a new prisoner, uh, things that they'll have to go through, screen and so forth, before they enter into the general population. And anybody visiting would have to now go through uh, some special processes. So I was there because my colleague needed some additional advice, and so we went. And we thought that by doing so, that we were being very proactive in terms of helping those persons who are at music now. But Mr. Speaker, you know, I, I heard some of the arguments that were being made, and I must say that with some of them, 
Let's take, for example, the actual motion. Apart from what is in the title, calling for the commission of inquiry, we also have at whereas clause number three, it pointed out that, you know, you had two deaths on the 19th of September. And then when we come to whereas clauses number five, it then some, somehow miraculously moved from being two deaths to the deaths of several prisoners. And my understanding of several prisoners would mean that it's more than two, right? So here we got just within one from, from whereas clause three to whereas clause five, we move from two to now several. And then when we come to whereas clauses six, it then gone to three persons died. So within the same document, we have these types of inconsistency. Now, there is no confusion in the sense of how many persons die. We knew that there were two persons that died. And the honorable member who moved the motion clearly stated that when she started uh, her presentation this afternoon by stating that. But somehow, when you read the motion, it's, it tends to try to amplify the actual situation that was there. And it moved from two to several, then to three. Something must be wrong with that. Got to be wrong with that. Something got to be wrong with that. And therefore, that is something that, again, we got to be careful about. Mr. Speaker, it stated that at whereas clause four, that there was a lack of information. From the time the incident occurred at Luziknan, every single newspaper in this country was reporting what was going on there. So you had Stabrook News, who spoke about what was going on there. Kaicho News, The Chronicle, Guyana Times, all of these outlets were reporting on what took place at Music Night. And then you have all the online sites, Demerara Waves, Newsroom, and all these other sites that were reporting on what to place at Music Camp. And it didn't end there. If you go back and you look at the newspaper, over the, the, the week or so, they continue with a number of follow-up stories, how many people were injured. I heard when Mr. Ramjatan made his pr presentation, he said 16 persons were injured. There were seven, the honorable member. There were seven persons who were injured. That was widely reported in all of the newspapers, all of them. So again, we got to be careful with what we are saying and how we amplify these things because it can be misleading to the public. And so, Mr. Mr. Speaker, we can, we can easily garner the information that the member is asking for. And if you, if you just go back to the newspaper, you will see all of this in there. Every single thing is in there. So this whereas clause that is saying that because of a lack of information so surrounding the following matters, it is a matter of public concern. All of the information is available. What else is there to disclose? What else? I don't know. But here it is that we are coming and we are asking for some special inquiry into what happened on the 19th of September. Mr. Speaker, it's interesting because apart from the incidents that the Honorable Member Mr. Ramjatan spoke about and some other, I think, Minister uh, 
Joe Hamilton spoke about, where we talk about what happened at the fire in 2016. If we look at that period from 2015 to 2020, the amount of incidents that you had with prisons in Guyana, it is quite revealing. And I just want to highlight a few of those. So the 3rd of March, 2016, Champ Street prison was set on fire. 17 persons lost their life. And then you have in 2017, on the 10th of July, you had another massive fire at Camp Street. On the 15th of October 2018, you had a breakout at Lusignan Prison. Three persons escaped, there was a fire, and then there was a subsequent riot at Lusignan where six persons were shot at and were injured. On the 6th of November 2018, there was another breakout at the security block of the Timeri prison, where one inmate was stabbed eight times and a prison officer was stabbed in his arm. In July 2019, another fire in the Holding Bay at Lusignan. On the 25th of May 2020, you had another breakout in the dining hall at the Timeri prison. And then, Mr. Speaker, on the 12th of July, 2020, another riot in the Holding Bay at Lusignan, where 15 persons were injured. 15 persons. And, Mr. Speaker, with all of these incidents, I'm wondering how many commissions of inquiry did we have? We had one, right? We had one, and I have the report here. This is the report of that commission of inquiry. And when you look, when you look at the recommendations, lots of recommendations that were made administrative types of recommendation. It has about welfare, infrastructure, judicial and uh, the judiciary and the magistracy and the legal things that you want to do. Standing law revision commission, the Guyana bar, parole board, rehabilitation program, vulnerable population, juveniles, indigenous, and then medical. And how many of these recommendations have we actually implemented? Not all. Not all. Not all. And so we did the commission of inquiry, but we have not put what they have recommended in place. Mr. Speaker, we have to work to improve the conditions in the prison. There's no doubt about that. We have to work to reduce the overcrowding that we are having there. We have to put better conditions in there. And we all know the tragic circumstances that led to some of those things. And Mr. Speaker, I've had some acquaintance with the prison system for a while because I actually served on the Georgetown Prison Visiting Committee uh, in the early 90s and became its chairman at one point and served there for a number of years. So I know exactly some of the conditions that were in there. And then I also served when I was the chairman of the Georgetown Prison Visiting Com Committee. I also served on the par parole board. So I have a fair idea, and I had the opportunity then to visit almost every single prison in this country and interview prisoners and talk to them and get an insight into some of the complaints. But the recent kind of thing that we have seen here have shown that we need to definitely do something about the improvement of the conditions in the prison. And you know, Mr. Speaker, 
the complaints that we got on the 19th of September. They're not, you know, we just didn't listen to them and did nothing about them. We were able to discuss many of those things that arise from the complaints that were made. This was discussed with the Attorney General. And I must say that out of those discussions, we were able to come up with some very creative solutions on how to have virtual courts. And late last year, by late last year, the Attorney General had about 20 such courts operating at the various uh, prison sites. And we are going to put another 12 more in the operation, bringing the total to about 32 virtual courts that would be in operation. The government has expended close to 500,000 US dollars in getting these types of equipment and its spaces and so forth to be able to hold virtual courts. So Mr. Speaker, we have been working. We have been trying to improve the conditions. We have been trying to address the concerns that was raised with us. And hopefully, some of these things that we have done would help to alleviate some of the situations that we met when we came into office. So, Mr. Speaker, I think from what was presented here, I don't think that right now there's a need for a commission of inquiry. What we need to do is to continue doing the reforms that we have, continue putting and improving the, the place, implement some of these recommendations that were not uh, implemented since the first commission of inquiry. We need to continue doing that. And we need all sides for us to put our heads together to make sure that we improve the conditions of the prisoners in our prison system. I thank you very much.